love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We're so thankful for you, Lord. We're so thankful for your presence, God. Thank you for this house to come and worship you, Lord. Lord, we invite you, Lord. Come and have your way this morning here in this place and online, God. We bless your holy name, Jesus. We give you praise and honor and glory due to your name, King Jesus. Lord, be loved this morning. We give you all of our worship. We give, the, we give you the preeminence this morning. You must have the first place, God. Lord, when we just declare this morning, you are worthy, Jesus. And you are high and lifted, high and lifted up, King Jesus. We bless you, Lord. And it's an honor to love you. And it's an honor to come before your presence today. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, just continue to focus on the Lord. Why don't you put your hand on your heart? Thank you, Lord. Have your way in our lives this morning. Um, I can't shake this as you continue to focus on the Lord. Is there, I want to make a short room for anybody that I believe may want to return to the, the Lord fully um, in here. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but the Bible is pretty clear. It says, make your election sure. And I was really feeling this, even as Mariah sang, you know, you won't relent until you have it all. Some of us in here, I believe either online or across the world, or under the sound of my voice in this house, you say, well, my life, I don't feel that it's fully yours, Lord. It may once was, but it's not in this moment. If, if you feel like that's speaking to you, could you please just lift your hand? We want to pray for you. You want to surrender your life fully back to Jesus. Awesome. Right here in the back. Okay. Praise God. Praise God. If we could just uh, gather around this man, we'll pray corporately right here in the back with this hand raised. Thank you, Lord. This is not the hour, you know, to have one foot in and one foot out. You want to go all in for Jesus. And he sees you. So let's all pray this together. Say, Lord Jesus, this morning, I give you my whole life, not by verbal alone, not by just spoken word alone, but I submit my life to you. I believe you were born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died and rose again on the third day. I'll have all of you, Lord Jesus. Now have all of me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give God praise. Isn't that good? Thank you, Jesus. Um, you may find a seat and tell the person next to him, you look glorious this morning. So, so good. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Really expectant. We have a couple of quick announcements that I want to get out of the way. We have an incredible guest this morning. We are about to get rocked. Yeah. Um, I want to honor him in a second. But um, a reminder, I think it starts this week. We have a corporate fast coming up. Everybody loves to shout me down on that one. <laughs> Praise God. Um, I think May 4th, yeah. Through the 24th, so that means you got about five days to eat whatever you want. And then uh, it's not mandatory, but we love to invite you into it. You know, corporate time of pursuing the Lord and leaning into him. I touched on this, I believe, maybe last week. But you know how the word says, Jesus says, uh, when you fast. So I believe it should be a common rhythm in the life of a believer, fasting and prayer and we're really expectant for all the Lord's going to do, I believe, both corporately and individually. So love for you to join us in that. And then also our spring trimester starts tonight. Yes. The building might set on fire. It might just light up. So anybody watching online or if you're still kind of juggling through it in person with us, we'd love to have you join us, squeeze in the last few seconds on the clock to enter in the um, spring trimester and you'll by default jump into the class of 2025 you'll graduate 2025 onto ordination and all that will be good so i want to skip tithing and offering and all that listen man i'm hungry it's about to be good i'm just going to tell you right now just give me a quick second hold your applause i want to honor a special special guest paul keith davis this morning um, he's an absolute general in the body of Christ, has impacted countless thousands across the world. Um, it's funny, many of you know, I, I went to an Assemblies of God Bible college and was so grateful where I cut my teeth on the fear of God and repentance and souls and just loving Jesus, but had no grid for the prophetic and all this whole dimension until the Lord tricked me with this experience in 04. 
And uh, literally one of the greatest impacts of my life personally has been Paul Keith Davis. And this regards and many others. I mean, he's the one I even heard. I think he coined the phrase revelatory realm. And I was like, what is this about? And, uh, but it's such an amazing father. I'm so grateful. His wife, Amy, just they're so deep in the Lord. And it's to me, it seems rare anymore to find somebody that's, that walks in such an Enoch type way with God but yet still rooted in the word, the spirit, but yet the power and the word and all of the above and a man of integrity. Never heard him dishonor anybody. This is so rare nowadays. I mean, I'm like, I watch, I've watched him for years. He walks in complete honor, looks so much like Jesus. So with further ado, please stand and honor Paul Keith Davis. Good morning. Wow. That's a very warm Georgia welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Be seated. That is just wonderful. Thank you for your kindness. Uh, thank you, Brian. I guess you guys know already you got a pretty special pastor, right? And that's really the truth. I'm not saying that to get a better honorarium, I promise. I, I really mean it and believe it. My wife, Amy, is not able to be here. She should be watching, I think, this morning from Oregon, a little early in the morning in Oregon, but uh, we have uh, believed in Brian and this church. We both have had revelatory experiences that we believe speak into your destiny, the destiny of your pastor, and I'm very honored to be here this morning. Next time, she'll come too, you know, and... She can help prophesy into this realm. So, amen. Well, thank you so much for the warm welcome. That was incredibly kind. I have so much to share this morning. I'm just going to jump in. Is that okay? I could maybe tell you a few stories or something, you know, to kind of get the motor running. But I'm going to just jump in because I feel like the Lord has something very specific that, uh, that he wants to do. So I'm going to pray. Um, and just invite the Lord to come. Wouldn't that be wonderful if he just decided to show up big time today? Oh, I'm waiting for that day. I've seen it prophetically. I've had visions where I've seen where the Lord comes in these corporate meetings in a, in a glory realm. I've seen it. I'm waiting for the day. And every time I get up, in fact, over there, I was praying, Lord, it'd be great if you just chose today to do it. This is a great group of people just come in your glory and surround us and overshadow us like you did that early church and empower us to do great things, to love you with all of our hearts, to lay aside every weight and encumbrance and uh, everything that would stand in the way. I feel the anointing already. That's, I can already feel something. I felt this little ping in my spirit just now. And I'm like, if I could go be alone right now and weep, but uh, I'm not going to do it in front of you. I'm from Alabama. But I believe the Lord is going to do something great. The Lord is coming. You know, even as I'm, as I'm talking, it's almost as if I can see this imagery in my own heart. You know, John, don't you want to see what John saw? How many of you like that? You read something in the Bible, you say, I want to see that. That's right. You were born for this hour. And I said, oh, Lord, I want to see what John saw. I want to be caught up, as it were, in the spirit on the Lord's day and look over into that dimension of the unseen realm. Goodness. And I want to see the Lord standing there with eyes like flames of fire. Ah. With his face shining like the brightness of the sun at noonday. Can't you just see it right now in your heart? And his hair as white as wool like snow, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. His voice was the sound of many waters, clothed in a robe reaching to his feet with a golden sash across his chest. And his feet were like burnished bronze. He had seven stars in his right hand. And you know what John did? He fell to the ground like a dead man. He had seen the Lord resurrected. He had seen his glorified body, but he had never seen the Lord revealed as the king judge as you and I are going to experience in this day. The 
this dimension of the living God when he renders a verdict in favor of the saints and the saints take possession of the kingdom. The right generation that's on the earth when he decides to answer all the prayers of all the saints and pick one generation to manifest himself, to do everything through them that he promised that he would do. That's you and I. There's a passage of scripture in Roman, I mean, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter eight at the time of the breaking of the seventh seal. I know this is deep stuff. But the seventh seal is broken. That's the end of the age. The seventh seal is the crescendo. It's the finale. It's the outpouring. (laughs) It's the harvest. It is the manifestation of the mature sons of God. It is the perfecting of the bride of Christ. It is the the bringing in of of the lost, the healing of the, the sick. It is God demonstrating his glory. One final time, you know to prove to the world that he is the resurrection and the life. In the time of the breaking of that seventh seal, the the Bible tells us that there is an angel that goes and collects all the prayers of all the saints going back to Enoch. You know why? Because Enoch was this prophet. He was a patriarch, but he was a prophet and he walked with God. The Bible tells us that. Can you imagine He walked with God and obtained the testimony that he was pleasing to God. And as a result of that, the Lord said, you know what? I got a loophole for you. Everybody else has to die, but not you. I'm going to use you as an example of what I'm going to do at the end of the age down there when there's a body of people that aren't going to have to die. They're going to live until the Lord returns. I'm going to take you up to heaven and I'm going to change you. But here's what he did. He said, now let me show you something, Enoch. Now just... This is the way the Lord teaches me. He puts his arm around Enoch and he says, now look down there. Look through this telescope in time. I got a generation down there in about the 21st century. I want you to look and see what I'm going to do with him. And he prophesied about it, right? He prophesied about this generation. It's in your Bible. Then Abraham, you know, he looked through that same telescope and he saw this generation and David prophesied about this generation and Isaiah prophesied about it and Ezekiel prophesied and Zechariah spoke about the end of the age generation and they all prayed towards what they saw. Do you understand that? They saw something and I'm sure they were like you and I, Lord, let it be me. (laughs) Let it be my, even Daniel, remember? Daniel had these amazing revelations and, you know, and and Gabriel says, well, here's the good news and the bad news, Daniel, you know, the Lord's going to do something really awesome down there, but you're not going to live to see it. You're going to die and go be with your fathers, but you'll be raised up at the end of the age and you'll have your part down there somewhere and somehow, some way. And so all these people prayed and prayed and prayed for that prophetic fulfillment. It even says in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, all these great champions that gave themselves, they lived sacrificially. They lived in holes in the ground, caves. They were drawn and quartered. They were burned at the stake. They were persecuted. They had their property stolen. The Bible says that in Hebrews chapter 11, but it says all of them desired that same promise. Though they died, they became a part of the cloud of witnesses waiting for you and I to inherit that promise so that they're made perfect. Is that right? That's in your Bible, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 39 and 40. If you want to put that up, it's not in my notes here, but that's free. (laughs) He says they obtained, the Bible says they obtained the testimony that they were pleasing to God. They obtained a testimony. They, they, uh, they, they achieved a certain place in God. And though they did, they saw the, the promise prophetically, yet did not live to see the fulfillment. But they're waiting for that right generation to be on the earth. That's you and I, friends. That's you and I. That is the truth. I'm on, before this morning is over, I'm going to do my best to, to give you some scriptural and historical foundation for you to believe that and even speak into this, this promise. So Lord, I thank you for every person that's here. 
Lord, you are the chiefest among 10,000, the one that's all together lovely. We want to see what John saw. We want to see what Paul saw when he was caught up into the third heaven and saw these great and amazing things. We want to see those things. Oh, I want to see what John saw when he was caught up and heard a voice say, come up here and I'll show you what will take place hereafter. And he saw one sitting upon the throne like a jasper stone in appearance, like a sardis and around that throne was a rainbow like the appearance of an emerald and around the throne were 24 thrones. And upon those thrones sat 24 elders clothed in white with golden crowns upon their head. And before that throne were seven lamps of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne was a sea of glass and lightnings and sounds and peals of thunder. Oh, oh I want to see it. I want to see what John saw. Those four living creatures that stand around the throne with eyes within and without, never ceasing to declare day and night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The one who was and is and is to come. That's what we want to see, Lord. We read about it in your book, but now we want to experience it. We have a group of people here this morning, Lord, that are hungry. And you said you would satisfy us. We're hungry for the revelation of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the unveiling, the disclosure, the manifestation of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm gonna say something and I hope you agree with me. I'm not just going to be satisfied with the phenomena of God. I want the person of God. Is that fair to say this morning? A body of people that desire to encounter the living God. Really, really genuinely walk with God. Let that happen this morning, Lord. Let something be imparted to every person here, I pray, that we would never be the same. That we can write today's date down on a calendar and say from that day forward, something shifted and I was never the same. I want to do something a little unusual for me. I'm going to go ahead and read three passages to you because I have a feeling that once I get going, I would, I would not give them to you. I would forget or get off and run out of time. So let me read three scriptures to you this morning, all of which have a central theme that came very clearly last night. I spent about a couple of hours in the hotel room last night, you know, just really praying. I had spent some days this last week in Alabama, my wife has been praying for these meetings that the right message would be delivered, that something would shift in the heavens. You know, we're not, nobody wants to have just another church meeting, I don't believe. I believe we want something to shift and something to change and something to empower us that, that is real and tangible. I know that. And the Lord knows that. And so he's raising up some people, I believe, to respond to the desperation of a people because you're born for this hour. Yes. You were born for this hour. That's exactly right. You were foreknown before the foundation of the world. That's in your Bible. Romans chapter 8, among others. You were born by his foreknowledge to live in this day, this hour, and to be seated right where you are at this very moment. And there is an awakening that's coming because there was something that was woven into us before the foundation of the world. It's called a seed, the seed of God. It's in your Bible too. 1 John 3, 9 says that we have the seed of God abiding in us. And on the inside of that seed are the Lord's invisible attributes, his divine nature and his eternal power. It's in that seed, it's in you. And so well, a message can come that strikes the seed and can't you just envision that seed kind of opening up, germinating, if you will, and releasing into you the life of God. And that's what makes you a son of God or a daughter of God, however you want to look at it. But the reality is the sons of God, the sons of God are not gender sensitive, right? 
Right. That's the only place that matters. You'll get that next week. But anyway. The Son of God is the Word manifested in flesh. Male flesh, white flesh, black flesh, white flesh. You know, the Word manifested in us. That's the sonship of God. The Word of God one day went down into the Jordan River. And when the Word of God came out of the Jordan, the heavens were split and the Spirit descended. And the Word and the Spirit became one. And the father says, this is my beloved son. Say, sonship is the union of the word and the spirit inside of you. So let me, I'm going to read these scriptures. Um, Bear with me because I don't want to fail to give them to you this morning. So I'm going to do it up front. So here's the first one. Jeremiah chapter 15, beginning at verse 19. I'll do it kind of quickly. Therefore, thus saith the Lord. Don't you love those words? See, I'm already doing commentary. If I do commentary on every sentence, I'll be here all morning. So I'll I'll try not to do that. Thus saith the Lord. I, I love those words. If you return, I will restore you. Here is the main point. Before me, you will stand, Brian. And if you extract the precious from the worthless, you'll become my spokesman. They, for their part, may come to you, but as for you, you cannot go back out into the religious community. Then I will make you to this people as a fortified wall of bronze. And though they fight and contend against you, they will not prevail over you, for I will be with you to save you and deliver you, declares the Lord. I will deliver you from the hand of the wicked, and I will redeem you from the grasp of of the violent going very quickly to Malachi chapter two, one of my favorites. I could just quote it. My covenant with him was one of life and peace. And I gave them to him as an object of reverence and and true instruction was in his mouth. Unrighteousness was not found on his lips for he walked with me in peace and uprightness. And he turned many back from iniquity for the lips of a priest should preserve knowledge Men should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. I think you see the theme of where I'm going this morning. And the final passage would come out of Ezekiel chapter 44. The sons of Zadok. The sons of the the righteous. The word Zadok means righteous in Hebrew. The righteous priesthood. Remember, I just read to you the the priesthood of Malachi chapter 2. This special, unique priesthood priestly community where true instruction was in their mouth. Unrighteousness was not found on their lips. They were the messenger of the Lord of hosts, pulling people out of one place into another. Here, the sons of Zadok, those that remained faithful to God during times of apostasy, of falling away, but they stayed true to God. They stayed true to David. They stayed true to the anointing. So let me read um, verses 15 and 16. The, the, the Levitical priesthood, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the sons of Israel went astray from me shall come near to me to minister to me. I'm going to slow that down just a little bit. Those that are faithful to God, those that are, are faithful to the word, what are they going to do? Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and whoever hears and opens, I will come in to them, and they will dine with me and I with them. That's New Testament there. I was quoting Revelation chapter 3, the promise to the Laodicean church age, which is what we are. We are living in Laodicea as a generation. The Laodicean spirit is alive and well. Lukewarm Christianity having a form of godliness, but denying the power and all the various things that go with that. The Lord said, I'll spew that from my mouth. So now he is responding to you and I individually. I'm knocking on your door. (laughs) Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if, if anyone hears my voice, I will come in. Language very similar to what you see here to this Zadok priesthood in Ezekiel 44. All right. So they will stand before me and offer me the anointing and so forth. 
Verse 23, this is the one I'm mainly after. This is the response. This is the, the fruit, the benefit of those that respond to the call. He's knocking on your door. Who's going to knock? He's on the outside, if you will. That's kind of the analogy that's been given. But he is, he is commissioning individuals right now. The Lord is meeting with individual people right now in a place of fellowship, in a place of union, in a place of intimacy, in a place of friendship. He is, he is meeting with us as he did those Zadoks. And you come out of that fellowship, that, that uh, communion with the Lord, all right? And here's what you will do. This is the commission of this church, I believe, at least in part. Verse 23, moreover, they will teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane, the clean and the unclean. I think you can see there that there is this trend here. There is a season of separation that's coming. The precious from the worthless, the clean from the unclean. Who's going to do that? The messengers of the Lord. It says in Jeremiah, you'll extract the precious from the worthless. Ezekiel, the clean from the unclean. Messengers of the Lord of hosts that turn many back from iniquity. I believe one of the primary commissions that's being given to us today comes from Acts chapter 26, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, as you know, of course, met with the Lord on the road to Damascus, one of those rude awakening moments, you know. But he's telling the story to King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26 when he tells him, he said, this is what happened. The Lord says to him, stand up on your feet. For this purpose have I appeared to you. Didn't want to sh what I've shown you and what I'm going to show you to open the eyes of the people, to bring them out of darkness into light from the dominion of Satan into the dominion of God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sin and obtain an inheritance among those that are being sanctified by faith in me. That's your commission. There are a lot of people out there that thinking they're in one condition, but they're in another. Can I tell you that the spirit of deception is alive and well? In Matthew chapter 24 alone, the Lord himself talking about this last day. When I keep pointing down there, that's you and I. <laughs> that's my way of telling you that's 2021. You know, 20, the 21st century, the hour in which we're living right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take 10 minutes here and kind of give you a little momentum of where we have been to push us into where we're going. But they're prophesying about a future generation. They're speaking about a future time, a generation that was foreknown, a generation that lives in the darkest hour. I think we don't have to look too far around ourselves right now to discover culturally this is the darkest hour ever. I have some, some connections with either some spiritual and political people that will tell you that what we see on the surface right now is only the tip of the iceberg. It's far worse than we think. And you might say, well, that's bad news. Well, it's reality, but there's a remedy. That's what, the, that's what you and I are called to be. We're not to be compatible to the world we're a contradiction to the world. That's exactly right. Now, if you're looking to be compatible with the things out there, you're in the wrong place, I think. <laughs> we are to be a standard. We are to be separate to pull people out of darkness into light from the dominion of Satan into the dominion of God by virtue of preaching the gospel and having a demonstration of power, right? That's what we're called. I mean, can I just take a couple of minutes here and just review with you what's gone on just in the last few hundred, not few hundred, few decades? Because you know, a lot of times people don't realize what the Lord has been doing to create this sense of momentum to push us into the hour in which we're living now. I think I got about 30 more minutes or so. Is that good? All right. I'm going to take every minute of it. If you got a roast in the oven, just put it on pause. No, I won't, I won't be too long. When I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in 1989, 
one of the first things that happened to me was that I began to get caught away. Now, I had no grid for that. I, um, as just a little bit about me, when I was 12 years old, when my, my uh, family was not Christian, <laughs> kind of like the other end of that. My dad was pretty rough. He's in heaven now, praise the Lord, right? If my dad is in heaven, there's hope for everybody. He was a rough guy and very worldly and whatever. But anyway, <clears throat> wasn't a pleasant upbringing, but, but the Lord's grace. But anyway, when I was 12 years old, I was standing at a window and, and I looked out the window and there was a cloud in my yard. And I'm thinking, even as a 12 year old, I can still remember it now vividly. What's that cloud doing in our front yard? I've never seen a cloud that low. And the cloud started talking to me. <laughs> and I said, who are you? He said, I'm God. I said, okay. You know. And he put parameters in my, I knew nothing and nobody ever, we didn't have a Bible. You know, so I, I didn't have any kind of grid, you know. I, I think I had been in kindergarten. They told some Bible stories, you know, in the South the way it was back in the, back in the 60s. But, but we didn't, you know, I didn't understand it. But the Lord put love in my heart for him when I was 12 years old. And that kept me from going into either one of the ditches on either side of growing up. You know, I could have gone into some serious anger and rebellion, but didn't. Then I got saved in 75, but in 1989, I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit and I started being taken places and I had no grid. The word vision was not in my vocabulary because I didn't even know God gave visions. That's how uneducated, I mean, I didn't even know that. Trance was not in my vocabulary. I didn't even know what latter rain revival was, never heard of William Branham, never heard of Catherine Kuhlman, never heard of John G. Lake, never heard of Roland Buck, never even heard their names mentioned in my life up to that point. And so I would have these experiences and, and there wasn't anyone around me that seemed to have a grid for what was, I was seeing, but invariably someone would give me a book or a tape of Smith Wigglesworth or, you know, Kenneth Hagan or some of those guys. And there it was, the very thing I had a experience. It was in, that, in their book. So I began to study the lives of some of these greats. And so I acquired over a period of years a pretty good understanding of what the Lord has done just over the last century or so. And it really begins, if I want to build, you know, build your momentum for where we are, just give me a couple of minutes. We're going to start in 1885 in a conference in London, England called the Beth Shan Conference on Holiness and Healing. 2,000 ministers from around the world met in London, England to, to learn and teach about this doctrine of holiness which led to healing. The, the idea was that then that if you walked in holiness in your soul, then your body would come into alignment and be healed that your soul issues was a re, were as a result of many of our physical ailments. And that's true. So that started in the course, you know, by, and, and then a few people, just these little forerunners began to be filled with the Holy Spirit, having an Acts chapter two like experience, but there was really no corporate understanding at that point. By the late 1800s or, you know, right, right at the turn of the century, there was a man by the name of Charles Parham, who had a, a school in Topeka, Kansas called the Bethel School of Ministry. And a, and a number of students by revelation were sent to Topeka. I've been there, I've been to the very place. I've spoken there in the very place where they were meeting at the turn of the 20th century coming into 1901. They had an all night prayer meeting at the turn of the, of the year into 1901. And, um, um, oh gosh, I don't go too deep into it. I take a while, but it's a pretty amazing story. Tongues of fire began to appear in this little school. And on New Year's Day, 1901, after having an all night prayer meeting, Miss Agnes Osmond got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and she really got it. She spoke in multiple known language, Chinese and these other different languages, literally speaking in other languages and so forth, and it began to spread and more and more people, and thus the modern Pentecostal age was born. By 1904, Charles Parham takes that ministry down to Houston, Texas. 
He's teaching the Acts chapter two experience uh, out in the hall, tragically, because he was a black man, not allowed in the classroom. A man by the name of William J. Seymour was sitting out in the hall. And there's something about, oh, I just felt the anointing when I said that man's name. William J. Seymour, this great man of God, was sitting out in the hall, had one eye. He was from Louisiana, if I remember right. And he's sitting there, and the Lord blessed him and filled him with the Holy Spirit. And he ends up, long story short, a man by the name of Frank Bartleman had been in intercession, believing for L.A., for Los Angeles to get the Holy Ghost to be changed and transformed. So they bring William J. Seymour out to California. He starts preaching in Bonnie Bray House, you know, and uh, so many people were coming, being filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, manifestations of the glory of God, that they had to leave the house on Bonnie Bray Street, go over to a little town, a little building, a rundown warehouse on Azusa Street. <laughs> oh, boy. William J. Seymour would stick his head up in a soapbox, literally, and pray until the fire fell. People came from all over the world to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ah, in the Pentecostal movement of the modern age. Here I'm trying to build your momentum. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to give you a little bit of the history. Remember what I said a minute ago? All these people have been praying for a future generation that will manifest the glory of God. They have been praying for this. Those guys saw what we're talking about right now. They prayed into it. They believed for it, but they didn't get to see it. Not in its fullness, because they saw a future generation that would. What if that's you? Let's jump over to 19, the mid-1940s. A lot happened in the 1940s, you know, after World War II. I'll start with, um, with Catherine Kuhlman. You guys remember her? Uh, this wonderful lady, very animated lady. But in 1940s, she uh, made a gut-wrenching decision that I won't go into right now for time's sake. But she's walking the streets of Los Angeles and, and uh, she makes a decision that will change the course of her life and even church as it was known. She, she died. If you've ever heard her preach, you know, she says, I can take you to the spot where Catherine Kuhlman died, remember? And she made this gut-wrenching decision and goes back to Pittsburgh or the area of Pittsburgh, Franklin, Pennsylvania, begins to preach the gospel People are beginning to be filled with the Holy Spirit and something really unusual happens. While she's preaching, people are healed in their seats. That was in the 1940s. Meanwhile, meanwhile, there's a little free will Baptist minister by the name of William Branham that had been having miracles happening in his meetings. He had no idea what was going on, but a very unusual thing was happening with him. While he would be in prayer, he would find himself taken out of himself, going into a hospital room, seeing a man lying on a bed with broken bones and told he would die. He saw himself standing there when his wife is across the bed weeping and a doctor comes in and reads a doctor's report, walks out. Then he sees himself pray for the man. The man throws back the covers, jumps out of bed and is totally healed. Then he's back in his body. So what does he do? Decides to go to the hospital the next day, walk to that very next that hotel, I mean hospital room, and there's the man lying there that he has seen in a vision. But he couldn't pray yet. Why? Because the conditions weren't right. So he stands there talking to the wife who's across the bed weeping because she said the doctor said his bones are all broken. He'd been run over by a car and his ribs are lying against his heart and his lungs. This is 19... This, has been, this happened in the 1930s, but this had been going on for him. This is an example. And so they had nothing they could do for him. The doctor comes in, reads the report, says, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. He walks out, and that was his cue. And he turns to the man and says, Thus saith the Lord, you're healed. And the man throws back the covers, jumps out of bed. Doctors are running in because they're thinking he's going to die for sure because his bones are all crushed and laid against his heart and his lung. The man walks over and throws on his overalls and walks out the front of the hospital. Oh, that's a true story. It's in my book. I wrote about that. But this man does not understand what's going on. So let me pick up the story. 
May 7th, 1946, this man goes up into a log shack, a rundown logger's shack in Indiana to ask the Lord, what are these things? What are these things that are going on with me? I don't have a grid. He couldn't Google it. (laughs) What is this? Praise until three in the morning. Wept until there were no more tears in his eyes. Just picture this now. You're in a rundown logger shack in the middle of the woods. 1946, no running water, no electricity. You, you've prayed until you couldn't, so you're just sitting in this little shack, and all of a sudden a ball of fire comes into the room, throws light down on the floor. Then, I'll, then if that wasn't enough to make you nervous... <laughs> He hears footsteps walking across the floor and a man walked in and stands under the ball of fire. You guys believe this? And the man says, fear not, for I am sent from the presence of Almighty God to tell you that your peculiar life and your misunderstood ways are because you're to carry the gift of healing to the nations of the earth. You're going to pray for kings and princes and monarchs. The man says, I'm sorry, sir, you've got the wrong man. I'm a poor man. I live among poor people. I can never pray for kings and princes and monarchs. The angel said, as Moses was given two signs, so also will you. You'll take the people by the hand and you'll discern this. And if you're faithful and humble in that, you'll eventually discern the very thoughts and intentions of their heart. And if you can get the people to believe you, nothing will stand before your prayer. Not even cancer. 30 minutes the angel spoke with him. The man goes from there and has his first healing meeting in June 14th, 1946 in St. Louis, Missouri and everybody in the building's healed. And that releases a healing anointing that is now known as the the healing revival. Can I take another really, another minute tell you a wonderful story? All right. I have spoken to people that were there in some of these meetings that witnessed some of this, but a man by the name of Gordon, I wish I could tell you the whole story, but Gordon Lindsay gets involved and he sets up a set of meetings in 1947 along the West Coast, going up California into Oregon, Washington, and eventually coming to Vancouver, British Columbia. So as they're making this tour up the West Coast, they go to Portland, Oregon, 1947, there was a man and his wife that had graduated from their their denominational seminary and they went to India as missionaries and they were totally defeated. They had no power, no miracle working power, no signs and wonders. They They came back home contemplating resigning their commission. It was a man by the name of T. L. Osborne and his wife Daisy. And so they started a, a prayer, a 40-day fasting and prayer, T.L. Osborne and his wife. And after the end of the, the fast, the Lord appears to T.L. Osborne. First vision he ever had of the Lord. But Daisy didn't get a vision. Now she has this on video. I've watched this on video. I didn't know them personally, but I know people that did. So she said, well, Lord, I, you know, I, I'd like to have an encounter too. So she hears about this meeting in town where this little Baptist minister who had gotten the Holy Ghost was having success praying for the sick, a man by the name of William Branham. The problem was their denomination was not cooperating in the meeting, so they couldn't go. She said, well, I don't care what they say. I'm going anyway. So she went around the church, tried to find somebody to go with her. Nobody would go. And she found this one 85-year-old lady. She said, I'm too old to care what anybody thinks. I'll go with you. (laughs) And she tells the story how she took that little 85-year-old lady, shows up at the building, and there was a shocker. Three or 4,000 people were standing outside the building trying to get in. They'd never seen that at their church before. She said, said, I'm, I'm telling her story now. She said, well, I was determined. I took that little lady and I pushed my way through the crowd. (laughs) 
I got to the front door. As soon as that door opened, I grabbed that little lady and I was like a woman at a shoe sale. <laughs> That's what she said. She said, I, I ran up and I got a perfect seat right in the balcony, right above the pulpit. I got to tell the story. Can I have five extra minutes? Okay. So let me just tell you what happened that night. Changed their life forever. So she's up there with a the little lady, you know, and this little, this little guy, Brother Brown, just, he was uneducated. He just comes out, simple little message, you know, talks about eagles and trying to tell the people about healing. He's waiting on the angel of the Lord to show up. So he's telling stories, you know, and all this, and all of a sudden, the Lord shows up and he says, now I take, the Lord is here. I take every spirit under the authority of Jesus Christ in this building. And he begins to pray and she's watching blind eyes open. The, the whole altar had been full of cots and gurneys and people are getting up off of the cot and the gurney. But then something happened that night. By the way, you can read about this in the writings of Gordon Lindsay. There was a man in town that was demonized that hated preachers, real big 250 pound guy. And he showed up that night. So Miss Daisy is up here in the pulpit, you know. The double doors burst open and this man comes in screaming profanities. Comes marching up, you know, as if he was going to do damage to the preacher and the police go to grabbing him. Brother Branham says, no, no, no. Let him come. So the man comes up and comes up on the, on the podium screaming profanities gets within six feet and can get no closer. <laughs> Gordon Lindsay was on the stage too and he could hear what Brother Bynum said and he took authority over that spirit and he said, devil, you have come into this building insulting the anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ and because you did, you will bow to the name of Jesus Christ. Miss, Miss Daisy's up here watching the whole thing. Gordon Lindsay tells the story. His sweat starts to come out on the man's forehead. And he's standing there and refusing. He said, one knee buckled. Then the next knee buckled. And he kneeled down right in front of everybody. Miss Daisy goes home that night, tells TL, you're going tomorrow night whether you want to or not. So the next night, I'm going to have to, I'll rush the story. He comes to the meeting. He's standing there. He tells the story. This is all on video. He's, Brother Bantam comes out, this little simple preacher. And he said, all of a sudden, T.L. Osborne said, I had my second vision of the Lord. The Lord came and appeared on that stage and stepped into the man of God. Stepped in. Now, I tell that story for a reason. I tell that for a reason. I, I, I got to pause right there because that is the secret to our lasting ministry. Union with the Messiah. Well, the Lord steps into us and does through us what he did when he walked the earth in human. That's the kingdom. That is the last day ministry. It's not just us going out and maybe doing some prophetic words. Those are wonderful, by the way. Or even praying for the Lord literally coming into us and expressing himself through us. That is the Bible. That is what the greater works will look like. And he was a prototype. He was an example of that. Catherine Kuhlman had a similar thing where that dimension of the spirit would come. There were several others. And by the way, you know, other men were commissioned out of that. In that same series of meetings, they go up from Portland to Vancouver. George Hawken, who has the Sharon School of Ministry in Saskatoon, um, Saskatchewan, brings a team over. The Lord speaks to them. Oh, by the way, I forgot the best part. When T.L. Osborne saw the Lord step into him, he heard a voice speak to him and say, you can do that, you can do that. Amen. And he took that same 
manifestation to the nations of the earth. And now millions of people have been saved because of the ministry of T.L. Osborne, one of the greatest missionaries of the 20th century, right? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? George Hawken is up in, uh, in um, British Columbia and the Lord speaks to him. You can do that. They go back and they begin to pray for nine months and the Holy Spirit falls and they release what is now known as the latter rain revival. It wasn't the latter rain, but it was what they call that revival. So that was all through the 1940s going into the 1970s. 1977, I, I'll move very quickly. A man by the name of Roland Buck has 27 visitations from Gabriel. No doubt about it. I've been there. I spoke to his widow, his son, his wife. In fact, I was just, Amy and I were just with his wife last year. I'm not his wife, his daughter. <laughs> his daughter last year, she, you know, conveyed these revelations. No doubt about it. Gabriel appeared to this man 27 times to transition us out of a church mentality into a kingdom mentality. Now, next time I come back here, I'll develop that a lot more of what that means of how you'll notice from 1977 to now more has been spoken about the kingdom than in, than in probably all the prior centuries before, because the trend, we're not about being a church. We're about being the kingdom, correct? The kingdom that is within us, the kingdom that is being mani manifested through us. And so you have that through the seventies and so here we are, we've got this, I'm going to stop there because I could just go into much more detail, but what I'm trying to emphasize to you is there has been a progression. There has been an unfolding and at every juncture that there was a, a, an outpouring of the spirit, there was an extraction of the worthless. Every time the Lord did that, something was revealed that had been embraced in prior seasons that is now being extracted in this season. You understand what I'm saying? There has been a sanctification. There has been a purging. There has been a, a purifying of our gospel, of the message that we preach. I'm going to tell you something. I may just get deep for one second here. I know it's a Sunday morning, but in the book of Revelation chapter 10, you see something really amazing. You see the Lord, you know, you know give, give, me, give me a couple of minutes to establish this. I already quoted Revelation 4 a minute ago, right? So John sees the Lord seated on the throne. This is kingdom stuff. So if we're a kingdom, there is a king who has a throne. So that's what Revelation 4 is all about, all right? The Lord on his throne because we are kingdom people. There are going to be people today commissioned from the throne room. Throne room revelation, throne room worship, throne room prophecy, no longer about church age stuff, see? Now, throughout the book of Revelation, chapter two and chapter three, you see seven churches, correct? And those seven churches represent seven church ages that have lasted 2,000 years. Okay, can you guys envision that for me? So the early church, Peter, Peter James, and John, that was Ephesus. Then after Ephesus, around three, the third century, you have Smyrna, the Smyrna age, and the message to them was very consistent with history. Then you have Pergamum around, you know, the fourth, fifth, sixth centuries. Then you have Thyatira, this long age that was 1,260 years long called the Dark Ages. Then you have Sardis, which was the age of Martin Luther, the reformers. Then you have Philadelphia, which was the age of John Wesley and George Whitfield and Charles Wesley, the missionaries. Then you have the 20th century age, which was Laodicea. Okay, you tracking? Yeah. All right. But you'll notice to every one of those seven churches, the Lord Jesus speaking, he says, to the church right, but to him that overcomes. Remember that? To the church of Laodicea, we'll just take the one because that's the one we've been living in. You know, he, here's what you're doing right. Well, he didn't tell them anything they were doing right. It was one of the few churches, he didn't tell them anything they did good. <laughs> so the rest of them, you know, some, you did this, you did this, but you know, you left your first love. Let's work on that. You work on that and I'll give you the blessing of an overcomer. But to Laodicea, he says, here's the deal. You think 
that you're rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing, but you don't even realize that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Amen. You're deceived. The Lord identifies deception, okay, as, as, as the dilemma. So he says, and I got some counsel for you. Now, if, if the Lord Jesus was standing right here with this microphone in his hand, and he said, I have some counsel for you, how many of you would do it before you got home today? Of course you would. But I counsel you to buy of me gold refined by fire, white garments to cover the shame of your nakedness, and I say that you may see. For behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone would open and to me, I will come in and I will dine with them and they with me. Then he gives the greatest promise of all to him that overcomes. If you can overcome that lukewarm Christian religious system, I'll let you sit with me on my throne as I overcame to sit with my father and you will rule and you will reign with me for 1,000 years on planet earth, but you have to overcome. Now, if you're in this church, you're an overcomer. I know, that, I know enough about Brian <laughs> to know that he has preached the truth. And if you're, if you're embracing the truth, that means that that religious cold system has no place here. So we're qualifying as overcomers. Okay, praise the Lord. There is a distinction there is a distinction between the church and the overcomer. So everything I'm going to say for the remainder of this next 15 minutes or so will be to the overcomer, to that remnant. The Lord told me they're the radical remnant. <laughs> the radical remnant. The Isaiah 13 mighty warriors. The Joel chapter 2, Joel's army, my army. The Lord said they're my army. And there's nothing like them before or since. <laughs> They're going to do great exploits. They're the ones that, that Jesus spoke of, I believe, when he said, the works that I do shall you do also, and even greater works than these shall you do. I believe it is the overcomers that are the bride that has made herself ready. You can see that from Revelation chapter 3, where it talks about Sardis, the church of Sardis. You know what Jesus said to them? He says, you only have a few people in the church that haven't soiled their garments. So they're born again, they're saved, but they have stains on their robes. So what does he say to them? I advise you to overcome idolatry because that was the issue of that church, idolatry. Overcome the false teachings in the church and you will have pure, white, clean garments clean robes. So what does Revelation 19 tell us the bride has? The bride has made herself ready and she is clothed in what? Pure, clean, white linen garments. That means the bride is an overcomer. Amen? Amen. The bride is an overcomer. And so here we are. We've had this building up of momentum over the last 100 years waiting for the right generation to be on the earth. Now, I know your question, and it's a good question. Why do we believe we're the ones? That's a good question. I believe when Jesus said the fig tree, I, I could be quoting, I'm having to quote these scriptures so you can read them for yourself later. But in, in Matthew chapter 24, when the Lord is talking about the end time generation, the end of the age, when it says the end of the age, he's talking about the end of the church age before the beginning of the kingdom age, right? In the, in the middle, the Lord returns and deals with the Antichrist system, right? Not mean to get too much in that, but that's what it means, the end of the age. We are approaching the end of this age, which, by the way, listen carefully to what I'm about to say, is the most biblically prophesied season of human history. There are more Bible prophecies in your word, in the Bible, dealing with this span of time than any other time in church history, including the generation when the Lord came in human form to offer his life. There are more scriptures. You know, there's over 100 passages in the Bible that talk about this generation. Over a hundred. 
Some tell me as much as 150. I haven't. I'm not a bean counter. <laughs> I have, I've done a deep dive over the last few weeks, and I have just found I have been shocked at the number of passages of Scripture that talk about you and I. That we are living in the hour when these scriptures are going to be fulfilled. You know, one of my favorite ones, I love Zechariah chapter four, when it says the capstone comes with shouts of grace, 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 grace. Okay. That was just a free little addendum right there. Let me, let me lead up to my, to my main point. So you have the church, then you have the overcomer. We want to be an overcomer. We want to be a victor. The word overcomer is nakio, from which we get the word Nike. It means a victor, a conqueror, an overcomer. And it says all through the seven churches, if you overcome, you eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You get a new name written upon a white stone that nobody knows. You get to eat of the hidden manna. You get authority over nations. You get pure, white, clean garments. You don't have to worry about the second death. And you get to sit with the Lord on his throne as he overcame to sit with the Father. That's our destiny. That's the hour in which we're living. Now, I want to close with this because this really has been the build up. I'm trying to get this sense of momentum. Wow, this outpouring and that outpouring, they all had meaning. And they all prayed to see the manifestation of God's promise, yet they didn't get to see it, but we do. But Israel is the fig tree of Matthew 24. Israel was reborn in 1948. I could spend an hour talking about that. Jerusalem comes back into the hands of the Jewish people in 1967. You have a prophet sent in the 1950s and 60s to bring a lot of restoration. We, and we've had several decades since then. Jesus said the generation that sees Jerusalem or is Israel being born will not pass away. We don't know what the generation is, but what we do know is we're close. Is that fair to say? Do we look out in the world and see the things that were predicted? I, I hope I don't have to tell you guys that we are in the environment and that many of us in this room might see this happen, maybe even myself included. And I'm not as young as I used to be. That we're living in that span of time when the Lord is going to pour out his spirit in ways we've never seen before. In Matthew chapter 25, following Matthew 24, the Lord talks about two groups of people. Well, most people see two groups of people in the teaching on the wise and the unwise virgins. There's actually three. There's three groups of people in that parable. There are the wise virgins, there are the unwise virgins, and there's the group that's awake at midnight. That says, awake, awake, the bridegroom cometh. That's who you are. That's who this ministry is called to be. The midnight cry folks. The ones that aren't asleep. The ones that awaken the bride to the seriousness of the hour. The ones that have a voice that says, trim your lamps, the bridegroom is coming. The ones that are the friends of the bridegroom that are anointed with the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the children back to the faith of our apostolic fathers. This community of the people that release an anointing on people to burn away cold, formal religiosity. This anointing that's on the midnight cry people that will say, awake and awake, you know, awake, awake, oh sleeper. That's what the scripture prophesies about. This group of people that will have an anointing to release healing. This group of people that will have an anointing to deliver the oppressed, to break the blinders off of the people. The Lord is holding you by the hand to watch over you, to bring you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring the people out of darkness into light from the, the prisons and dungeons. For behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I'm declaring new things. And before they spring forth, I declare them to you, says the Lord. That's where we are right now. 
the new things are being poised to be released. That's exactly right. Not poised, are being released. They are, as we speak, these things are being released and you're being called, not just your pastor, not just his leadership team. You are being called to be a voice to this generation, a voice to Atlanta, to awaken, to call people out. Don't you want to see people coming out of darkness into light? Because the Bible describes that people think they're in one condition when they're in another. Wouldn't that be awful? To think that you're clothed and ready for battle only to find that you're naked. And there is a revelatory mantle. There is a spirit of revelation that is being given to this community of people to be able to see for yourself where we stand in history. Because you can't operate on your pastor's faith. You gotta have your own. You gotta have your own revelation. What he'll do is bring you to the waters, but you got to drink. <laughs> That's exactly right. Lord, just send these, send the hosts of heaven in here this morning. Whatever this realm is that's moving around the room, I just ask that you send them. We welcome them, right, Brian? We welcome the hosts of heaven. We welcome the hosts of heaven, the angelic hosts, the assignments that are being given. I believe there's a number of you that are being assigned angels for intercession. I believe you're intercession. This is unusual for me to pray, but there is something being released to a people right now, an assignment and you're going to go behind the veil to do your praying. You're going to go into the spirit to begin to intercede with the heart of the father. There is an anointing being released right now. Some of you are being assigned. This young lady right here in the blue sweater. Uh, I've just, yep, you, you just looked at yourself. Yeah, there's something going on with you. I've just noticed it several times. I keep being drawn right there. There is an assignment, I believe, that's coming to you. This lady back here in, in the, the, the blonde hair, there's something going on with you in these assignments. Several people right over here, there's some activity going on. So I just know without a shadow of a doubt that there is an assignment going on right now from the realm of the spirit. There's a big guy right here, the kind of a weightlifting sort of guy. You're my kind of guy. I like, there's something going on with you. I feel like there's some dreams and some revelations the Lord is affirming for you right now. It's almost like you've been saying, is that really going to be me? Absolutely. Absolutely. No doubt about it. The Lord has got his hand on your life. You might say, well, I've messed up. So, so is everybody else. There's something going on with you right now, sir. The, the, this shift, this transition in the new, uh, a new realm of faith is being given to you to believe, to really believe. Absolutely. I'm going to stand like a, like a statue for God. I'm going to, I'm not going to be moved. That unwavering faith is being released right now. An uncompromising faith, an uncompromising, unyielding spirit that's going to say, I'm going to make my stand and I'm not moving. Oh, I feel that. <laughs> I felt that when I said, I'm going to make my stand and I'm not yielding. Isn't that, isn't that right, mama? You know, you know, that's right. Yeah, I do know, you know. I do know you know. Absolutely I do. I can see it on you. Don't you want to be that person? The one the Lord says, well done. You did good. You refused to compromise when it had been easier for you to compromise. You refused to back up when darkness came at you like a flood. You refused to yield truth wouldn't have been easier to believe a lie. That's what's, being, that's what's going on right now in this room. I believe some determinations are being made right now that I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand at the end of the road and I'm not gonna be ashamed when the Lord appears because I did my best. We don't have to do it perfect, we just have to do our best. So Lord, I release that over this room right now in Jesus' name. This, this young lady right over here, I just looked over, I felt myself being pulled over here and there's, a, there's something going on right around. You were the, were you the, the violinist? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I didn't. No, you weren't, you, you sang, right? But you played the violin? 
there's something going on with you. I, I just felt myself being pulled, both of you. You know, when I talked about kingdom songs, you know what I'm talking about, going behind the veil to access the realm of the kingdom. And, but when I saw there's something going on with you individually, this, um, this assignment that I've been talking about, but I feel like for you, it has to do with revelation, like dreams and visions and revelations. Do you have this, do you have a visionary history or some, some people in your family line maybe that were visionaries? But I just want to pray over you that you would, that you would be the beneficiary of your family lines. That, that when the, when the curse, see, listen carefully, when the cur- when, when the curse is broken, we can restore back to the third and fourth generation. So I want to speak to her restoration back to the third and fourth generation, pulling back into your life what may have been lost in the prior three generations that, that, and I'm talking about spiritual giftings, but it could have multiple applications as well. So I bless that my, my young sister, I bless her with visitations of the spirit, with dimensions of the revelatory realm of heaven to begin to access the unseen realm. Lord, I pray that all over this building that there will be individuals that you give them eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand. Grant that, Lord. The, um, there is a lady right through here you have on a white jacket. Um, um, you have blonde hair. Yep, I think you just put you in. I just want to pray for you. Um, I don't know. You look familiar somehow. I don't know how that is. Have we met before? Oh, yeah, okay. I, I, I didn't want to act like I... But there's something going on this morning with you as well. Um, it's almost like you were brought here as a Kairos moment, um, even more than just the message I have been bringing. But I just want to bless you that, um, that more authority. I just see this realm. You know, one of the blessings of the overcomer is that they receive authority over nations. And I believe, uh, and I can't remember now which one, what is that, Thyatira maybe? But, um, but that blessing is of an overcomer that you'll have authority over nations, a greater dimension of authority, you know, like Jeremiah had, where Jeremiah was told to uproot, tear down, destroy, but also plant and build. I think that kind of a dimension is being given to you, some authority to uproot some darkness, uproot things that don't need to be there, tear down structures and strongholds that don't need to be there, but also very quick to prophesy and release the kingdom in its place. So I, I want to release that over you. So a dimension of authority to do that realm. There may be other applications of that, but I believe that's a very specific word. And, and also, and the Lord is watching over his word. I'm still in Jeremiah 1 for you. But he's watching over his word. I feel like you've got some words that are very old. Um, you know, you're not very old, but I mean, you might think they're old. A few years old. But I mean, some words that you've been hanging on to a long time, almost to the point where like, oh, man, I'm about to give up on those. I feel like the Lord is watching over his word to perform it. Now, that's for somebody else, too. Who's got some really old words you're about to give up on? Stand up on your feet. There's something on that. Just some words you've had. I'm like, Lord, you know what? I'm about ready to give up on this one if you don't do something. Well, we're going to do something. We're going to do something about that. We're going to pray and ask the Lord to send these watchers, the watchers that watch over his word. So, Lord, bless every one of these that are standing. Lord Jesus, bless them, I pray. Uh, just just kind of receive. You don't need to hear a word from me right now. I think we're in this dimension of the Spirit, if you want to come on up. We're in this realm of the Spirit right now. I, I bless this man back here in the T-shirt. Um, you got a little beard. You're not looking at me. But, yeah, just you, sir. I want to bless you. Just release a word over your life the Lord would visit with you, that he would touch your heart, touch your life. There's something, I just saw something going on around you. Every one of these that are standing, let hope deferred be broken off of their life right now. Let hope deferred be broken. Bring new life to them. New life to these words that they have poured themselves into. They've even prayed. They have fasted. They have believed. And now, Lord, all the, all the no's, make it a yes. <laughs> make it a now where now is the day of salvation. Now you'll receive what you have believed. That's what I pray for you. I bless this church. I bless this pulpit that the heavens would open in a fresh way where realms of authority and revelation would come. 
Can you mind standing here? And I bless Brian. I, I pray for you tonight, but brother, I just want to. I just want to release over you this mantle of a messenger. For the messenger, you know, true instruction is in his mouth. Unrighteousness is not found in his lips, for he's turned many back from iniquity. For the lips of this priest should preserve knowledge, and men will seek instruction from your mouth, for you are the messenger of the Lord of hosts. I got that very specific for you last night. I put that in and wrote it down just for you this morning. I release that over you. May this pulpit be opened up to the greater dimensions of revelation and insight like never before. That you would bring people out of darkness and into light. From the dominion of Satan into the dominion of God. Grant that, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Wow. Can we um, honor Jesus through Paul Keith? You can stay standing. Um, maybe if the worship team could help me and the prayer team come, just stay in that this atmosphere. We'd love to pray with you, man. How many of that blessed you guys? <laughs> can, oh my gosh, I couldn't keep up. Like swinging a glory sledgehammer around. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, so um, yeah, maybe the prayer team could come and I'm going to pray and um, we'd love to also minister to you if you have any personal needs, just agree with you, let the spirit continue to move, but let's just place our hands upon our heart. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for Paul Keith, God, thank you for the prophetic word, the, the dimension of the kingdom that's in this house, we receive all of it, all of it, we receive, God, your will be done. Seal it all by the Spirit. Glorify Jesus, I pray. Corporately, um, personally, across the world online, our extended family. Glorify Jesus, I pray. Thank you, Lord. Be pleased. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. You can just go as you feel led, Mariah. But yeah, if you'd like prayer, agreement, healing in your body, we'd love to invite you to come.
Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for the word of the Lord today, Jesus. God, we honor you in this place. We honor what you have said and what you're speaking and what you have spoken this morning, Jesus. Father, give us grace to become these overcomers, to be steadfast, to stand, to stand firm as an overcomer in these days, Jesus. We thank you for your presence, Jesus. We thank you for the realm in this room, Lord. We thank you for angelic assistance, Father, angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man and us. We thank you for the word that was spoken today. We receive everything that was released today, Lord. Glory to glory, Jesus. Lord, that those who are marked, those who will never be the same again, those who, who, who their eyes were opened to see what the Lord is saying and their ears were open to hear what the Lord is saying. We thank you for the shift, Lord. God, we ask for your fire to fall, Jesus. Fire fall down on this place, Jesus. Fall down on this company, Lord, this, this bridal company, Father, those who are called to awaken the sleepers. We say, awake, O oh sleepers. Let us pull forth and pull out your bride, Lord, to call them up higher, Jesus. Give us grace to stare at your face, Jesus. Give us grace to, to see what you're saying, to hear what you're saying in the secret place, Lord. To become these overcomers in Jesus' name. Let your word become alive, Lord. To receive everything that you have for us in this season and where you're taking us for all of those who prayed for us in the previous generations, Lord, the great cloud of witnesses, Father. Open our eyes to see the time that we're in, Lord. Let us be a light in these, these dark times. For you are the light, Jesus. Increase that, Father, I pray. Grant this to us, Lord, I pray. As we go out from here, Lord, be with us, be around us, be in us. Let us become one with you. Even as Paul was saying, Lord, let us become one with you, where you come up within us, Jesus. As you're knocking on that door, let us open the door, Father, that you will dine with us and us with you. In Jesus' name.